Okay. So let's start off over here with. Um, okay, so we're going to do Penetrant level one today. Uh, I know Heido has the PowerPoints. Augie, do you have the PowerPoints that I sent to you? No? Do, you, do, you want, do you want me to email them to you before we go ahead and start? Yeah? Okay, uh, let me go ahead and, and hey, send you one. One. Yeah. We're just going to follow you along because. Um, so if you want to email them afterwards, that'll be good. So that way we can follow you the next class and everything with them okay. in hand. Because I'm not going to be able to print them here tonight. Uh, or not, there's not that many papers. There's maybe like 30 or 40 sheets of paper left right now. Uh, I'd have to go downstairs and get more paper. So All right. No problem. So let's just continue on with this. I know Hyde has got them. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, you should be able to see my screen by now, right? Yep. If you can see my screen, kind of give me a thumbs up or something. Guys? You can't see my screen? Yes, yes. We can see your screen, man. Augie says no. You should see me now. Yeah. And uh, n now you should see my screen. I see your screen, Juan. Okay, good. Awesome. All right, so we're going to start off with here. Okay, liquid penetrant level one. Okay, and this is going to be a 16 hour course, right? Uh, and in your certificate is going to read uh, 16 hours, right? Which will comply with SNTTC 1A and and also NAS 410, NAS 410. <clears throat> <All> right. <laughs> Before I even go any further on this, I think we pretty much went over the, the qualification and certification. Right? We have gone over this every time we take a, a course, but we'll just briefly touch on it. Right? Uh, we know what standards are, right? And we know we do our written practice. Uh, using this standards and the written practice, right, is the one that is developed by the employer to specify how he's going to conduct the the how he's going to administer and and you know and certify uh, administer the test and certify his NDT personnel, right. So the written practice, the employer must create a written practice for the qualification and certification of all NDT personnel. The written practice of each employer must be approved by an NDT level three. The employer is responsible for the certification of all personnel. Right? That's the that's it's the employer's ultimate responsibility to make sure that everybody has met the requirements as set forth on his written practice. Right. And that his written practices is is, uh, is correctly uh, developed. <coughs> so qualification, right, uh, involves the training, which we're doing now, the classroom training, the OJT, which will you get, which you will be getting later on, the ability to pass a written and practical hands-on test, right, which you will take that once you go ahead and pass. The, the experience and the, and the once you meet the training requirements for for OJT right, for experience and for classroom training right and you have passed your vision test which includes which involves a, a visual acuity and a color contrast then you will go ahead and take a test which is a written test right a general uh, which is a test like uh, very similar to the ones you have taken now which is a general a specific and then also a practical right. And once you have passed those, then you would be certified on whatever level you are being certified on. So organize. So the qualification, right? The training, it's uh, it's classroom hours, right? And we're doing 16 right now. <laughs> and they should, right? Require a general and a specific and a practical test, which we have been doing, right? And the education, right, it depends on the written practice, how many hours you are required, right? Some written practices may require you to do only five hours of penetrance. Others may require you to do, you know, if it's aviation and maybe they have, 
the written practice based on NAS 410, they may require you to do 16 hours. So that's why we're, we're doing this class, right, And for 16 hours. So you meet all the requirements. And NAS 410 is one of the most strict uh, standards out there, right, that deals with aviation. The experience, you have to be, uh, you have to document all the hours, right, and those experiences, hours, the, those OJT hours have to be signed by a level two or a level three. Right? And uh, you got to be able to pass uh, a vision test every year, right, for vision acuity uh, through the use of a Jager 1 test and the color tests uh, to make sure that you can differentiate colors which, in, which are involved in the use of your, in the method you're going to be certified on. So certification is a written testimony that the individual has been properly qualified. There's two things, right? Qualification is more like the requirements that, that you need to be certified. The certification is the certification stating that you have met all the qualifications, right, all the requirements. So a certification, it's a written testimony that the individual has been properly certified, qualified. And it should, the certification should have the person, the individual's name, the test method in which he's been certified, in this case we would be penetrant, the level of qualification, we're doing level one, right? the date of the, of the issuance of the, of the certification, right? Title, please put it on mute. Thank you. So certification is a written testimony that an individual has met all the company's written practice, all the qualifications of the company's written practice. Okay. So with this with this course right now, you should be meeting the, quali the qualification requirements, right, for classroom training or for organized training. <coughs> There's three levels of uh, NDT personnel. We have level one, level two, and level three. All right, and we know the differences. We have gone over those uh, in the past already. But just to uh, talk about it again, right? Level one uh, is are, are those people who have uh, who are uh, who can only perform a specific task in the a specific inspections, and uh, they gotta be right. Uh, they cannot provide training to trainees, people that want to be trainees. Right? They cannot develop uh, procedures. Right? Uh, level two is a person who can do any inspection on his, on whatever method he's qualified on. Right? It doesn't have to be in a specific task. And uh, this person can provide training to level one and trainees who want to be level one. So he can provide training to trainees. Right? He can provide OJT hours to trainees that can, that want to be level one, and also to NDT level ones, right, that want to become level two certified, right? And then after level two, you can be a level three. So a level two can do that, but he cannot write procedures, right? And he cannot certify personnel. A level three can do all of the above, and also he can write procedures, right? So if, if we need to inspect the part, and the manual doesn't tell us how to inspect it, the level three should have enough uh, knowledge, right, on material processing and so forth, to be able to come out to come up with a procedure on how to inspect the part. <coughs> a level three can also certify personnel. You can also be the one appro uh, approving a, a written practice, right, uh, for a company, right, and he can be providing training. That can provide training to you right now. And uh, and and uh, and provide training and provide certifications, you know, and, and be able to uh, give you tests and grade those tests. Okay, so let's start off really quick here with uh, the introduction to liquid penetrant, right? So let's start off with a little history on on penetrant, right? And penetrant is one of the oldest methods of NDT, okay. The origin of liquid penetrant is generally attributed to the inspection of wheel accesses in railroad industry back in the 1890s. Okay. <coughs> so the old 
the oil and whiten test involves immersing the test object in an oil and then wiping it with rags, right? Dampening with uh, kerosene. Then we would go ahead and powder shock, uh, right? And dust the whole surface to increase the visibility, right? And then any oil leak, right? We would be able to catch it on that dust cloud that was on, that is on, or that dust surf, uh, surface, that dusty surface, right? So that's how, if there was a crack, when you apply the oil, right, <coughs> what you do is you apply, let's see if I can write on this. Let's say we had some type of crack, right? We apply some oil to it, to the, to the, to the surface, right, with the, with the intent of having the cavity or with the, with the crack, where the crack is, fill up with oil, right? So we'll wait a little bit, we'll let it fill up with oil, and then we'll wipe the surface clean, right? To just leave the oil inside the damage, right? And then once we wipe the surface clean, we will go ahead and put, right, some, some powder chalk, right? So which is like a, a white powder on the surface, right? And because this is a liquid and this is a, uh, like, a, like a powder on top of the surface, then at this area where you have the oil, then you will go ahead and have an indication. You would see it. Right? And that's how we started with liquid penetrant. So MDT methods are used for the following reasons, right? We want to ensure the product integrity and reliability right? to avoid test object failure, prevent accidents and save lives, right? To make users profit, you want to ensure customer satisfaction. You want to aid in better product design, to lower manufacturing costs, right? To maintain uniform quality levels, to ensure operation uh, readiness, right? So all of those were reasons why we want to, why we perform NDT, not only penetrant but all NDT inspections on on our on products, right? We want to go ahead and 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 get all those advantages out of using NDT, right? Versus, you know, probably having our products fail before we are expecting them to fail, or even worse, you know, probably have uh, your product failure cause some type of uh, of accident that. Could involve, you know, the losing of li uh, losing some lives, right? In the plane, in the in the case of a of an airplane crash, right? Uh, a sinking boat, and and so forth, right? So some advantages of liquid penetrant testing include the following, right? Uh, liquid penetrant testing quickly examines all accessible surfaces. Something I could not stress enough, right? Is that or something I want to know, I, I want you to know is that penetrant is only, it's only uh, effective, right, on on open surface, this, uh, on, on discontinuities that are open to the surface. Right? So if you have this block, and then you have this block, right, and this is your crack, and then here you may probably have a crack here, right, if you use penetrant on this type of block, you would never get any type of damage because the, the, the defect is not often to the surface. In this case, you would go ahead, a penetrant would be a suitable method for inspecting this type of damage because it's open to the surface, right? So that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the limitations we want, we want to know, right? So when we start checking for, for problems, right? you would never want to say that you have a subsurface discontinuity with penetrant. Otherwise, everybody's going to know that you're not, you don't know what you're talking about. Penetrant is only suitable for often surface discontinuities, right? Uh, something about penetrant is that it could detect very small surface discontinuities. I have detected discontinuities in penetrant, with, with penetrant that I have not been able to find with the naked eye, not even with a 10x magnifying glass, okay? And uh, uh, it was it was an aircraft that we had an inspection to be done, and I found it was fitting, right? So, <coughs> and I found it using eddy current technique, right? 
So, and for those of you that have had eddy current, I did a high frequency, right, which is, there's not much penetration. You're very, you're checking very superficial uh, defects. And I went ahead and I found out some indication on my fitting. And so I, I came back, I requested them to remove the paint, you know, just to see what was underneath the paint. There's nothing visually that I could see, that I could, that I could have seen, and I did my eddy current again. I did a high freak, and sure enough, I was getting my indication. So I went and I compared it to the, to the other side of the plane, which it has a similar fitting, right, from the opposite side. This is a fitting for the landing gear door. And uh, it usually cracks. And I, would ne I couldn't find a crack on the other side. So I came back and I, and I started determining that it was cracked. And at the end of my report, I put that it was a crack fitting. Uh, they, re they ended up replacing the, 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 uh, the fitting, right? And then later on, I took that fitting and I, I, was, I was figuring, I said, maybe this is because I'm doing a, a high freak, right? I'm not penetrating much into my material. Maybe this is going to be a discontinuity that's, that's going to be open to the surface. So let me go ahead and do penetrant on this. Well, sure enough, when I did a penetrant, I was able to see my cracks, right, that I could have not seen with my naked eye, not even with the 10x magnifying glass. Okay, so liquid penetrant, depending on the sensitivity level that we use, we can we can find very small surface discontinuities. Right? Remember, never subsurface, always surface, with penetrant at least. It can be used. It can be used on a wide variety of uh, materials, including including ferrous and non-ferrous metals and alloys and fine ceramics. Uh, unlike, uh, for example, <coughs> a magnetic particle that's only used in ferrous materials. Okay, uh, eddy current uh, penetrant can be used in non-ferrous. Okay, unlike uh, eddy current, right, which can, which is only done on materials that are conductors of electricity, right? This can be used in non-conductors, such as ceramics, right? And uh, an ultrasound, right, depending on 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 our on, on 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 the equipment we have, right? And depending on how how the the grain structure of our material, if it's a casting and all this, uh, maybe Finding a subsurface surf, uh, discontinuity can be challenging, right? Whereas with penetrant, due to the material properties, right? Whereas with penetrant, we can do all these different things. However, it's the only surface, okay? It uses relatively inexpensive and non sophisticated equipment, right? Penetrant, we use some, uh, we have a spray cans, right? And we can make it, we can make it into a line of penetrant, which we have tanks. Right, in which we can dip our parts into, but we can make it as simple also as spraying some uh, some liquid into our part. And pretty much, just to give you a little quickie on how penetrant works is, right? You have uh, you have your part, and then we're gonna put the red here, the green. We're going to apply, so if, if this is the surface I'm looking at, my, I'm looking at, or I'm, I'm expecting my problem to be, I apply a coating of my penetrant, which is going to be, if it's fluorescent penetrant, yeah, because it, we have also visible penetrant, we apply a, pe uh, uh, right, we apply a coating on, on the surface, right? And then we just let it sit, right? We let it sit there, we let it penetrate, Right, and we have a word for that, which is dwell. Dwell in time is the time we give this coating of penetrant, right, to penetrate into any defects that we have. Okay. So once that time has gone by, then we're going to come and we're going to clean it. Right. Then we're going to we're going to come and then we're going to clean. We're going to wipe it clean. Or we can, depending on the method we're going to use, we're going to learn about that. Right? And maybe we're going to clean it with water, or maybe with solvent, right? or maybe we're going to apply right? an emulsifier, but I mean, we'll get to that later. So,
Right. So we have our, our part now, which is clean. Right. And we just have penetrant on our discontinuity. Right. So due to capillary reaction, right, uh, this little this penetrant that's trapped in here is gonna blot, is gonna try to come out, right? And this penetrant when it's fluorescent, right, when you when you put a light a UV light, right, an ultraviolet light, right? When you shine a light to it, it emits a light, a yellow green light, right? Which will give. I mean, you would do if it. There's two types of penetrants, right? There's visible and there's fluorescent. Visible, we do it in some uh, industrial aspects. Uh, visual is not allowed. Is not. Um, you're not allowed to use it in aviation. So in aviation, we do uh, fluorescent, right? The difference between fluorescent and and visible is that. Visible is usually a red dye. Right? Imagine instead of being green, it's red, and then you just cover it. You put a, another coating on top, like the white powder, right, being the developer, and then you could see the red stain the white, and you would see the crack. In the case of a fluorescent, you go in a dark area, right? You apply your penetrant, you let it sit, you clean it, then you go in the dark area, and with a UV light, right, an ultraviolet light, you shine it to your inspection area. And if you have any type of defects, right, and you could also apply a developer. We're going to that later. But the whole point is that we should be able to see the line of penetrant only from the discontinuity. Because if had there, you know, if there was no type of defects on the good, if there was no uh, cracks here, then when you wipe the clean, there was no penetrant and trapped in the material, right? Whereas if there's a defect here, all your penetrant went in there and when you wiped it clean, well, you didn't remove the penetrant from inside, the defect. So penetrant requires uh, a lot of cleaning, right? And if, if you have a dirty part, right, you could miss your parts, right? If you have grease inside this crack, right, you can still have that crack, but then your penetrant is not going to go in because once you wipe it clean, right, you, you, your penetrant didn't penetrate because you have that grease work. Or that dirt, or whatever type of uh, you know debris you have in there. So in penetrant, we want it to be very clean. But ultimately, you know, the equipment we use, if it's fluorescent, well, you're probably using a, a, a flashlight, right? And then you're you're just using liquids. You're not. It's not like penetrant, like ultrasound or you know X-ray or or eddy current that you're using this expensive machines and probes and cables. You know, or or transducers, or if you're doing, or if you're doing, uh, no, or if you're doing like immersion test, okay, you you don't need a tank. I mean, at least to be getting water pads and transducers and a bridge, and I mean, you don't need none of that. So it's very inexpensive, and is you know you're using non sophisticated equipment. The sensitivity magnifies the size and location of discontinuities, right? So the size defect, the line we're gonna we're gonna see, okay, is not gonna be proportional to the size of the defect we're gonna get, right? Because the penetrant is gonna magnify our discontinuity, right? For example, you have some crack here, right? When your penetrant is here, like I said, due to capillary action, this penetrant is gonna start blotting out Right, and it's going to start leaking out in this. Right, so you will see a wider, a wider crack, and maybe a longer crack, right? Because the penetrant, the blotting action of the penetrant, so it magnifies, it magnifies the size and the location of your discontinuity. Sensitivity can be adjusted by the selection of penetrant, the removal technique, and the type of developer. Okay, and we're going to go and to what those are in a minute. Technicians can visually detect indications, okay? Uh, you can visually see them using the penetrant, okay? Whereas a lot of times, I mean, when you're doing eddy current or you're using ultrasound, right, uh, you don't have a visual of your of your crack or, or the damage or the, the discontinuity you're, you're, you're getting, right? You would just see indications on your screen, but you would not be able to see the type of uh, 
like the shape and you know now you can map it but you can you can't really have a visual on, on the defect whereas with penetrant right because you're looking at it with a with a flashlight if it's a fluorescent right or if it's, if it's a visual just by looking at it you could see where the crack is uh, liquid penetrant testing can be used for uh, in-service checks to resolve production problems early. Right? And uh, that's pretty much what, uh, what they're doing. Uh, you know, penetrant can be used in manufacturing plants, right? Whereas you want to find the problem before you, you have the finished product. Right? If you have a, if you have a, you know, if, if you're having, if you're, if you are, uh, let's say Honda or Toyota or any one of these car manufacturers, they are, they are machining the crankshaft, let's say, or the or the camshaft or the crankcase of the engine, and uh, maybe there's hidden cracks in it, right? I mean, hidden in the sense that they're not visually, uh, they cannot be detected visually. Then you want to go ahead and you want to go ahead and catch those before you know, especially let's say if it's something like the crankshaft, you want to make sure that your crankshaft is not cracked, right? Uh, I mean, you want you want you want to know it's cracked before you start assembling all the engine together, right? Because I mean, what sense does it make for you to put the engine together, turn the car on, and then have it break, you know, or give it to your customer and have it come back a month later and say, you know, your crankshaft broke on you. All right, so we we want to use it before, just to make sure that it's gonna you know it's gonna uh, prevent all these production issues. Right, we want to catch them early. Availability of liquid penetrant. Right, we have three different types of dyes. Right? We have type one. Right, and we said that we can only use this in aviation. Right, uh, this one. And this one cannot be used in aviation. Right. Then type one being fluorescent penetrant, which requires that ultraviolet light, right? Because it fluoresces. We're going to see a picture of that. Then you have visible, pen visible penetrant, right? Which is a color contrasting penetrant, and we're going to see a picture of that. And then you have a type three, right? Which is a dual mode, right? You do both. In aviation, even if it's a dual type, you cannot use it. Right? It has to be a type one, and I should have. Uh, I can show you here a picture of some penetrant. And uh, just for you now, this is uh, this is a block right that was had penetrant, and these are maybe cracks right, and with the use, this is why you see like all this. Bluish purple color, right? Because of the of the um, of the fluorescent light that's been shined to this, right? And wherever you have that penetrant, you, you see that green yellow color, right? This is a little background, right? Maybe we can wipe it a little more clean. Okay. This is a bolt, right? Maybe you can't see this with your naked eyes, but right, these are these are with penetrant, we can find these cracks, right? And again, this is vis this is not visible. This is fluorescent, right? Uh, this is right now. These are fan blades. These are uh, turbine blades. I'm sorry. And uh, on this on this case, right? They they are they apply the penetrant, which is that dye you see, and they are in their dwell time, right? They're penetrating, right? and after this. I need somebody to mute their thing. And uh, after the dwell time, we're going to go ahead and clean those off for inspection. And this is your visible, right, in which you apply the liquid, the red dye, then you, keep it, you, you wipe it clean, and then you apply your developer, which is this white, white powder. And wherever you see that bleeding, right, uh, you would expect that to be a crack, right, because that's penetrant that was entrapped in the discontinuity. And when you apply to your developer, it's stain your developer. Okay, so this is the visible type. You don't you don't require uh, a, an ultraviolet light, but it's not acceptable in aviation. Right? Let's see, and you can make it penetrant 
you know, as it's in this picture, you can put it, you can use the spray can, right, uh, for visible and fluorescent, in the sense that if you if you are out in the field doing a pipeline or something, you can do it with this. But also for you know, depending on on your on on how big your parts are, you may have a, a penetrant line which looks something similar to this, and you have your tanks, right? And you can dip your part in the tank, right, to avoid spraying, right? It makes uh, so you know less material consumption. Or, or not consumption, but at least uh, you're, you're wasting less material. Right? Or, you know, you can have a gun and spray it, as in this case. Right? Again, that's another penetrant line. Right? You could also, with a little hose, you can spray your parts. Okay? This other guy, right? he has the part, and he's spraying the part with the penetrants, he's spraying Right. And also, right? So we can we can do it. Uh, and this would be a kit. Right, where you have your your UV light, your flashlight, or your UV lamp. This is not really a flashlight, but it's a lamp. And then you have your penetrant, right? Your cleaners and for and this would be more for uh, and you know a field assignment, a field job that you're gonna do. Okay. So we got those three types of penetrant. Right? Now, on on type one, right? On type one, we have different sensitivity levels, and this sensitivity this sensitivity levels are going to be important, right? Because they are going to decide how big of an indication you can you can pick up, right? And uh, how big of an indication you're not going to pick up. Now. You may be asking yourself, well, if you want to, why would you want to use this versus, you know, ultra high? So th if this would pick up uh, smaller indications, why would I want to use the rest? You know, well, if it's a, if it's a material that can uh, that has very that has a lot of that is very porous, okay. What happens is, uh, imagine this. Okay, imagine imagine a, a person that overreacts, right? What happens to a person that overreacts? Every little thing you tell them, they make a deal out of it, right? And it's the end of the world and you know you just insulted me and blah blah. So that is the same thing as the sensitivity levels. Right? In this case, this person or this level it's more reactive than this here. Right? So if you were to have, if you were to check a part that has a, a, a couple scratches, the surface is not very smooth, right? If you were to go ahead and apply this, right, and then you apply another part with the same, right? Or part half of them, right? So you have half this part, right? and you've got a couple of scratches here and there, and then this side you do level one half, and this side you do level four. But what happens is when you wipe it clean, right? Because this Maybe this was very porous, right? And it has scratches, right? What happens is when you wipe this clean, right? Let's say you had a crack here, right? you're gonna be able to see this crack, and maybe you won't be able to see this scratches, right? And the pores. Why? Because it's a thicker penetrant. It's not gonna penetrate as easy into that, right? Whereas in this case, right, you may have penetrant go into the little pores, into the little scratches, into the crack itself, into everything. So when you wipe it clean, right, we put our, our flashlight, that's it, kind of light. So we put our light, right, and what you see here is you're going to be able to see your defect, and on the back, right, because you didn't really react to that because it's not very important, then you're not seeing your indicate you're not seeing anything, you're just seeing your crack. Whereas in this one, right, because the surface finish, you may see that even though you wiped it clean, you have penetrant coming out of the pores, coming out of the scratches, coming out of everywhere. Why? Because it's reacting to every little tiny bit of thing you have in there. Right? So depending on the indications we're, we're looking for, the type of defect, how big of a defect, and you know, depending on, on our surface finish, we're gonna pick 
which type of level of sensitivity we want to use. Right? If you use a very high, ultra high sensitivity level on something like this, right, you may not even see the crack in comparison with the scratches and the pores and the dents because you have a back, we, what we call background is the, the, the contrast ratio between, right, the, the penetrant and the back, and the back. So in the example of, right, my contrast ratio would be the, the ratio between all this area, right, and the actual uh, crack itself. Actually, those are all cracks, okay? Same thing here, okay? So you want a contrast ratio, right, that is good enough so you can differentiate where your background is and you can trace your crack. Yeah. Yep. You okay there, Juan? Uh, I'm here. Okay. Where you been, bro? What was the last time I you guys heard? I said you were talking. No, about no. The, the last level. thing, no. The last thing you said is that we passed the class and we didn't have to take the test. Yeah. Right. Did I tell you how much it was gonna cost you or no? No, you skipped that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the last, what was the la what the was last, last part the last part huh? you said bro that you were gonna email us the uh, certificates 
right? Okay, so where's where's the last thing I I shot? Talking about the levels of the light and uh, I'm here. Okay. Where you been, bro? What? What was the last time I you guys heard? I said you were talking about. No, no. The last thing, no. The last thing you said is that we passed the class and we're gonna have to take the test. Oh, no. He was talking about the, uh, the uh, level of the, the, uh, the uh, ultralight. Did I tell you how much it was going to cost you or no? Oh, you skipped that part. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. The last part? We need to erase. Bro, we can't keep around like that, bro, because we're saving these classes. Right. Okay, so where's, where's the last thing I... <clears throat> Hello? Yeah. Okay, I'm here. How are you guys doing over there? Good? Doing good, doing good. Alright, what was the last thing I said now? I just said. <clears throat> you were talking about the, 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 the amount, the, the light that you use to look at the... The ultralight. Uh, the ultralight. The ultralight. Now, I did, I did mention about the... The different levels of of sensitivity, right? Yeah. Right. That, that's where you were getting. Yeah. You were getting and, to. It. And I said, right about the different surfaces finishes, right? And yeah. if one material is more porous than the other one, why you would want to use a lower sensitivity versus the higher sensitivity, right? Yes, right. sir. Okay. So we're good. I guess. I guess we kind of disconnected at the the point where we we're good. Okay. So let me share my screens and and just. Heido, you are okay over there? Heido? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay, put it on you now. <laughs> I was I was reading the, uh, the uh, you know, the, the, how do you call that, bro? The PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and uh, let's put it on, on okay, good. Give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen, please. Awesome. All right. So, continuing on with this. So, type one we have right, which is fluorescent, right? Something to to keep in mind, right? Which is only in aviation. We can only use this type in aviation, right? We have different levels of sensitivity, right? And type two, right? There is no sensitivity levels, right? They all have the same sensitivity. Now we have something that we call the method or of removal, right? So the method, and the method, right, stands on it. it, it uh, mean uh, and the method of removal is that means on how you're going to remove on how you're going to remove the penetrant of the surface uh, of the surface of the part, right? So type one and type two are further classified by the method of removal excess penetrant, right? So we have method A. Method B, method C, and method D. We have all those four. And method A is water washable, right? meaning that the penetrant right, has an, an, a built-in emulsifier in it, and so you can rinse it with water to clean that penetrant off the part. Okay? It's, like I said, you have the part, right? You have your crack, let's say. You apply your penetrant to the surface, right? let it well, and then this penetrant has an emulsifier in it that when you spray it with water, right, this emulsifier, this penetrant washes off the surface, right, and only leaves the penetrant that's entrapped into, inside your, your cavity. Now something to keep in mind is you need to control the pressure, right, at which you're going to shoot, uh, at which you're going to spray the water, right, you want to keep it at 40 psi maximum, okay? No more than that because then you would have you would have too much pressure, and you could possibly uh, clean the penetrant of your discontinuity. Another thing is you want your stream of water to shoot at a 45 degree angle, right, off your surface, right? You never want to shoot 
at 90 degrees because, again, you could also be cleaning up the penetrant of your discontinuity. You just want to get the penetrant, right, that is not in your cavities or that it's inside your defect off. You don't want to get, you want to leave the one that's in your crack, you want to leave it inside, okay? So water washables, right, they have, they have their own built-in emulsifier, right, and you just splash them with water, you know, you just spray some water on them, you rinse them, and you'll wipe off that penetrant, right? That's method A. Then method B is lipophilic post emulsifier. Well, method B, right? Method B, what we do is we apply our penetrant, okay? And then this penetrant, right, is not, or, or this method of, uh, of, uh, of removal, right, is not water washable in the sense that the penetrant is water washable, right? But instead, we need to apply something called the emulsifier. Emul emulsifier. No. The emulsifier, right? And what we do is this emulsifier, right, is going to be oil based. Right. And it's going to mix with our penetrant so that we can make it water washable. Right. So we apply our penetrant, we let it dwell, right, and then we apply our emulsifier, right, that is going to be oil based, and then you're going to spray it with water to clean it, to wipe that penetrant clean off the surface. That's why it's called lipophilic emulsifier, post emulsifiable, right? Because we're going to put the emulsifier and to, to clean it. Then we have another one that we call it solvent removable. Solvent removable, right, that method of removal is you apply your penetrant on your part, right, and your penetrant, right, it's on the part, and then you're going to get a rag, okay, and you're going to dampen it with uh, solvent, right, acetone, uh, alcohol, right, and then you're going to, with it not, you're not going to spray the part directly with the solvent, but instead you're going to get a rag, right? You're going to you're going to dampen it with your uh, solvent, and then you're going to wipe the surface clean, right? So that's another method of cleaning it. And then obviously you want to leave only the penetrant that's inside your your, your discontinuity. Now the fourth method of its, of uh, of of uh, removal, it's going to be, right? You apply your penetrant, right? Obviously, your penetrant is going to go into your discontinuity. And then you're going to apply, just like you did for this one, you're going to apply an emulsifier, right, to mix with the penetrant, right, and make it water washable, okay? Now, there's different, why do we not just go, instead of water washable, why do you want to start using lipophilic and hydrophilic? Because it's less, you can spray by the using of, of uh, water washable penetrants, right? This, wa this water washable is going to be, uh, for example, you have this here as your penetrant, right? Well, when you spray it with your water, every tiny bit of that penetrant that you hit with water, right, is going gonna, is gonna to get cleaned. Cleaned off. So you want to shoot at 45 degrees to only wipe off the top surface, right? And leave this area down. When you use an, a pulse emulsifier, right? Well, the, that means that the penetrant is not going to be washed off just with water, right? So when you apply your penetrant, right? You apply your penetrant, and all this is your penetrant, right? When you apply your emulsifier, your emulsifier is going to combine with this penetrant, right? And you want to let it sit just enough so that it combines with the top surface penetrant, right? So that when you wash it with water, right, you clean off this top penetrant and you leave this here. Now, because this emulsifier hasn't mixed with this, you can you have less risk of washing it off if water was to get in contact with this penetrant, so that's so light. So 
so post emulsifiable penetrants are going to they're going to be a little more harder to wash off. I mean, to wash off if there are inside if we have uh, if they are inside the discontinuity. Okay. Now, hydrophilic and lipophilic. The difference is that the post -emul the emulsifier in this case in the hydrophilic, it's water based. Right, and in the lipophilic, it's going to be oil-based. Okay, so again, a little recap: water washable, our penetrant has an emulsifier because the water, the the penetrant is oil-based. So when you spray, when you're trying to clean a surface, right? You, let's say you spill some oil. You're cooking and you spill oil in your countertop. Well, if you try to get your garden hose, right, to clean it. Or if you get if you get your your garden hose to clean uh, your driveway because you had a gas uh, an oil leak on your car, well you're gonna see that it's not gonna clean it very well, right? So water washable penetrants have an emulsifier built into them that would make them water washable. That when you spray it with water, right, you're gonna clean it off. Lipophilic pulse emulsifiable, right? It's a it's a it's an oil based uh, emulsifier. That you're gonna mix with your penetrant after it well, after the dwell time, okay? To wash it off the surface and only leave the penetrant that's inside your cavity. Solvent removable is gonna be the, with the use of a, of a rag, okay? You're gonna dampen it with solvent, right? Whether it be acetone, alcohol, or one of of, of the solvents approved by the manufacturer, right? And then you're gonna go ahead and Wipe the surface of the of the of the part, right? Now, then hydrophilic is just like method B here. Method D and method B are very similar, it, except, right? I mean, we're gonna see some differences later on. Not now, because we don't want to make it too confusing. But hydrophilic, it's something similar to method B, except that is water based, right? Okay. And then we have what we call developers, right? And uh, developers, uh, they are used to make that, to uh, amplify our indications, okay, and make them, and uh, make them uh, blot out of the discontinuity, okay? So you have your crack. You applied your penetrant, right? You already applied your penetrant in it. Now your penetrant is filled here. Now you cleaned it, right? You cleaned it. Your surface is clean. This is clean, and your penetrant is only here, right? If, you, if this is a fatigue crack, which is like very, very, very thin, very small that you can barely see it with your eyes, maybe not, not even, right? When you look at it with your flashlight, right? Uh, you may only, it should be, maybe it's too small, right? So we, you apply this other thing called the developer. And what the developer does, right, is going to is gonna go ahead and, and uh, put a film of, uh, like, the powder on the railroad, right, and, uh, and, the, and the oil, right? It's just going to make this blot, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make this come out, even more, right? So it's going to magnify your indication, right? So you have a bigger and more more noticeable indication on your part, right? Now we have different forms of developers, right? We have dry powder, like you know, just like you can say, you can see it there. It's it's a it's a powder and it's dry, right? You also have form B being water soluble, right? It's Right, it's it's uh, you have the particles in the water, and they mix with the water. Right? Then you also have water suspendable. Uh, water is that uh, particles of develop the developer is suspended in water. Right, so you need to uh, agitate it before you use it. Otherwise, it's just gonna is, is not gonna mix with the water like water soluble is. Right, and then you have non-aqueous type one, which is for fluorescence. 
We have non-aqueous type 2, which is for visible dye. And then you also have special applications developers. And these all do the same thing. They're just different forms of developers. Okay. They are there to magnify our indications right, and help us see it easier. Right. Now, when we wipe our indications clean, or when we wipe our penetrant clean off our surface, right, uh, to uh, after the dwell time, we have we clean. There's we ha we use solvents, right, and we have different solvents, and they're divided into different classes. One class being the halogenated, okay, class two being non-halogenated, and class three being special applications, right, and uh, depending on the part, right, and what the part it's made out of, right then you would go ahead and, and use uh, different different uh, solvents. Right? So if, if you cannot use halogenated, right, then you have to use non-halogenated, and that would pretty much be given to you, or it would be told in the, in the procedure you're going to be using. Okay? So safety precautions, right, for fire. Uh, materials are usually combustible. Right? We want the minimum flash point of open tanks to be no no less than 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. So in the case of uh, in the case of let's see. In the case of this, uh, in the case of this tax here, right? We don't want the point or the right. The flash point is the the temperature at which the 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 chemical will produce vapors that could ignite. Okay, so we don't want our penetrant flash point, right, to be at no less than 200 degrees, right? So at temperatures over 200 degrees, our penetrant is going to start. Uh, it's going to start in uh, kind of letting go of some gases, right, that can be combustible. Okay. Uh, we don't want to smoke, right, or have open flames near our, our tanks if we're using tanks or the spray cans if we're using spray cans. Storage should be away from heat and open flames. We usually want to keep this in, in uh, fireproof cabinets. And uh, you always want to review the MSDS, which is the material safety data sheet, in case of any any problems, okay? And the MSDS, right, it'll tell you what to do in case of, uh, let's say if you, if you drank some penetrant for whatever reason, right, it tells you what to do, what the, you know, it, it, it might tell you induce vomit, you know, or, you know, just drink water or don't drink milk or go to the doctor or, you know, if you got it in your eye, it might probably just say wash it off, rinse it off with water. Or it might very well just say, you know, uh, go to the doctor right now. Okay, so you want to be familiar with that. Skin irritation. Uh, anytime you're using lines like this, right, uh, you want to be using gloves. You don't want to be using, you don't want to be barehanded like these people are here. Right? You want to, you want to protect yourself. When you're when you're doing this, you don't, you know. You see, you can see this fellow here. He's got gloves on, you know. All right. So you want to wear some gloves. You just don't want to go ahead and. You want to wash your hands immediately when in contact with penetrant materials, right? Now you want to wash them to prevent uh, skin irritation. Right? You don't. You don't want to uh, just keep that penetrant there. Right? Drying, drying action can occur from skin from oil bases. Okay? 
avoid splashing of materials. You want to wear protective uh, gloves, aprons, and glasses, right? uh, especially if you're doing a especially if you're doing a, uh, if you're doing something like. Um, Especially if you want to be doing a, no. If you're going to be using a penetrant line, right? You want to go ahead and be using all this protective gear, right? And protective hand cream, uh, hand cream is it's also good. Air pollution, dust and vapors are non-toxic. Inhalation of excessive amounts of uh, can be held hazard. Exhaust fans should be installed for the use of dry developers, right? because they are like a powder, or they are a powder. So you just don't want to make a big old cloud of uh, powder. Fans should be used in the test areas to remove vapors, right? and uh, always follow the recommendations for respirator or mask use. Always want to take those into account. So ultraviolet radiation, right? This is the light that uh, this is the, the radiation, right? Or the frequency, the the, the wavelength, right? Uh, that my that our flashlights or our fluorescent ultraviolet lights are gonna emit, and right? they are, they have a these lights have a wavelength of 365 nanometers, right? And they cause the the penetrant. You know, at this frequency, they cause the, the penetrant to fluoresce, right? So higher frequencies, right, are, harm, uh, are harmful to humans, right, to your eyes. So we want to stay within that range. So anytime we use a uh, penetrant uh, and, and it's fluorescent, we just don't want to use any light. We, we want to use a light that, you know, that emits uh, a wavelength. Actually, the wavelength that we want is 360, but... 360, 365 is what we want. The 360 to 370 nanometers, it's acceptable. Ultraviolet lamps filters are used to prevent this harmful rays from harming uh, humans, right? And uh, I will show you here. And this is the filters that they're talking about. Right? Uh, this here, this glass here, it's used to filter all the, the light radiation and just have the 365 wavelength uh, rays go through, right, to kind of avoid your eyes. If you were to take that filter off your light, okay, if you were to take that filter off and turn the light on, you would get a very powerful... Uh, a very powerful uh, spotlight, pretty much. Okay. Now this, these bulbs are not. These are special bulbs. Okay. These are mercury bulb, mer mercury bulbs. These are not just any type of bulbs. Okay. And they're pricey. They're expensive. Okay. So you want to make sure that when you're using a lamp that has a filter, right? You want to make sure that the condition of that filter it's is the best it can be. It's not cracked. If it's cracked, you gotta immediately uh, change it. Okay, just because it's not bothering your eyes, or just because you know you don't think it's much of a problem. No, it has to be changed. Right? Uh, and obviously, protective lenses or goggles should be used if necessary. Okay, so that that is lesson one, and that's a that's a very good. Uh, that's a very good uh, start for liquid penetrant. So lesson two. So procedures and techniques. 
Procedures can be broad and cover several specific techniques. Each procedure and technique should be approved and signed by a certified level three. So cleaning processes, right, should include the following. And these are the cleaning processes before we go ahead and, and actually apply penetrant on the part. They're not really referring to uh, they're not they're not really referring to the cleaning process or the removal of the of the penetrant after you have applied it. This is the cleaning process before you even attempt to put the penetrant on the plant on the part, right? You can use solvents, you can use detergents, you can use vapor degreasing, which is a very old method, but it's very effective for oils and greases. You can use steam cleaning, you can use ultrasonic, you can use chemicals, right? Uh, paint stripping, right? And and they are if 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 one needs to be uh, necessary, right? Then it might be specified on on the procedure you're gonna you're gonna be doing. You're gonna be uh, inspect. You're gonna you're gonna have for your inspection. Free cleaning of test objects. All cleaning methods must meet the following requirements, right? They must be locally environmental. They they must meet the local environmental requirements, the health and safety requirements. And they should cause no harm to the test object, right? We don't want to clean, right, and uh, and destroy our part in the process. Substrate should be wiped clean with an approved solvent cleaner. Solvent cleaner should be allowed to dry completely before the application of penetrant, right? The surface properties of the test object determine the surface preparation. High nickel alloy, titanium, stainless steel requires the use of low sulfur and chloride products. Okay. Surfaces need to be free of foreign materials which block open discontinuities. Right? We know that. If it if, uh, if foreign materials such as dirt, grease, uh, you know, dust, whatever you call it, it's inside the discontinuity and is not open to the surface, that is open to the surface, then penetrant might not migrate or might not penetrate into your claw, then making not a penetrant, you know, uh, your 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 test would not be uh, would not be uh, I guess appropriate if you can call it. Right? Cleaning operations such as, such as pow, uh, power wire brushing, uh, grit blasting, shot peening, and other uh, metal smearing operations should be avoided. Right? So, wire brushing when it's powered, right? Like uh, you don't want to use it. Grit blasting, you don't want to be doing that. Grit blasting is when you're actually shooting, right? Uh, some type of like sand type particles onto your onto your material. Right, to clean up, let's say paint or something you have. Right, the problem with this, right, is that for shot peening, is you're, sh you're actually shooting these little balls, these like uh, pebbles, and uh, what you're doing is if you have any type of crack that's open to the surface, because you're hitting it, right, and it's such a such a strong process, you might be smearing your metal and kind of moving these metals to close up. To close the discontinuity, especially if it's a small uh, crack, right? And so, if that happens, you have to do what it's called acid etch. And what it does is it's chemically, right? So we have our part, and smeared metal is covering our in indication because we shot clean or we grit blasted, right? So what we do now is uh, we do acid etch, and what acid etch does is it removes a layer of the top surface of your of your part, right? So if you have any type of uh, any type of uh, smeared metal, it'll remove it right, with this acid, and you can have an open surface again. So if you were to if you had if the part you're gonna inspect was previously acid was was previously 
grid blasted or shot peen, right? Or it was uh, maybe sanded down really hard, right? Powered, powered, uh, wire brushed, right? Then you might want to go ahead and have them acid at your part because you know that if you have smear metal covering your, your indication, then you would not find, you would never find that indication with a crack, with a penetrant. Pre-cleaning and post-cleaning. Liquid penetrance test will be ineffective if, if the substrate, substrate is not physically or chemically clean and dry, right? We want our parts to be clean and dry. Liquid penetrant residue may be harmful, may have a harmful effect on the test object if not properly removed before placing it in service. The, comp the compatibility of cleaning agents and penetrant materials should be verified to ensure acceptable penetrant tests. Okay, solvent cleaning. The application of solvent cleaning may be, may be immersion, sprayed, brushed, or wiped. Solvent cleaning is, com is commonly used for spot inspections. Okay. Uh, solvent cleaners must evaporate readily and completely from the substrate. Cleaning solvent cleaners should be used to remove organic contaminants only. Right. So here we can see the guy cleaning the object, right, with uh, this this cloth, right, and it's probably and it says here that it's a damp, uh, damp free cloth. And the why the reason why you want to have it uh, that that you, you want that uh, rag or that uh, right, whatever you're using to be lint free is because all those little if you leave uh, lints on your part when you look at them with your ultraviolet light they will kind of look like cracks. So when you see those, all you got to do is just blow them away. Just blow them, and if you see them move, obviously they're not cracked. But it's better to use lint-free cloths, you know, for the applique for the, you know, to clean this, um, right? And you never want to spray the solvent directly onto your part. You want to spray it onto your cloth, and then just wipe it clean. Detergent cleaning. Cleaning is accomplished by the use of immersion tanks and or detergent solutions. Cleaning is accomplished as follows. Detergents, what's the, sub, the substrate? Penetrates various soils, emulsification, saponification, which is when it changes to soap, and then the, the substrate is rinsed and dried. This is the detergent cleaning equipment. Uh, suitable recent, uh, rinsing stations, suitable drying stations, uh, thorough ring, uh, rinsing and drying after detergent cleaning will leave the substrate physically and chemically clean for liquid penetrant testing. Now, when the when the parts get to you, most likely they're going to be clean. You're not going to be the one cleaning them. Right? At some point, uh, you may be asked to do it. Right? Uh, especially if you're doing like small parts or if you're in a small company that don't have a cleaning department. But 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, the part is going to be uh, clean when it gets to your hands, right? Now, uh, you may be the one saying that it's not clean enough, knowing, uh, you know, the type of, uh, of uh, for example, on, on, the, on the comb bolts or the bolts, right, that you have a bolt that's like this. All right, so this is your bolt, and the mechanic comes, right, and he, he gets a rag and he wipes it because it's full of grease. But then you notice that all this here is full of grease. Right, inside all your, your, your threads, Right, because he just grabbed a cloth here and he just wiped it. So this is clean, right? All this is clean. Maybe he cleaned the head, right? But now he gives it to you and, and maybe you're trying to find for cracks in here. Right? Well, guess what? If you have this here, well, that needs to be cleaned. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to 
see the surface, right? You're not going to be able to be touching the surface of the of the bolt itself. So in that case, you tell the mechanics or whoever is cleaning to go back and clean those, right? Because you know, you as, a, as an inspector, right? You know what you're looking for, and they don't, right? They they just think that because it looks clean here, then it's clean enough, and uh, well, not really. Maybe you're inspecting this area, and that little bit of grease can give you a big problem. So uh, you want to make sure that your part is clean. Vapor degreasing, right? It's an effective way for removing oils, greases, right, and other similar organic contaminations. Vapor degreasing does not require a rinse or drying step. Okay, I've never seen it. I know how it works, but I haven't really seen it. It's very old. Vapor degreasing can be hazardous to the environment. Vapor degreasing safety is a large concern due to health hazard. Vapor degreasing is limited to cleaning of, subs of, of substrates that have been approved for this type of cleaning method. Mm. Give me a minute. Let me see something here. Okay. So steam cleaning. Pre-cleaning with, with steam and alkaline detergents provide ideal cleaning. Okay, alkaline detergents emulsifies, softens, and dissolves organic contaminations. Uh, steam provides mechanical action of removal of detergents, contamination from the surface of the substrate. Steam cleaning is suitable for cleaning large, unwielded components which are not easily submerged. Right, then you also have ultrasonic cleaning, right, and is often combined with a detergent or alkaline cleaning. Combined ultrasonic cleaning improves efficiency and reduces the cleaning time. Right? Uh, ultrasonic cleaning is helpful for determining large quantities of small uh, test objects. Ultrasonic agitation uh, requires a special approval on some substrates, right? And ultrasonic cleaning is just uh, these tanks that emit these frequencies, these ultrasonic frequencies, right? And make your part kind of vibrate, you know, in a sense. And so when they are immersed into this uh, solvent, right, if they get clean very well. Uh, I don't know if you if you're aware of that's how this they clean also a lot of jewelry. Like you, you put uh, rings, watches, and others. You put them in these tanks uh, with solvent, and they they are ultrasonic tanks. They buy, they they send they have this ultrasonic uh, they have this ultrasonic frequencies applied to that liquid right, that kind of makes it vibrate, and so it removes this. Uh, Foreign objects or foreign uh, dirt. Right? Uh, rust and surface scale removal. Approved commercial rust and scale and surface scale removers include the following: acid rust removers and alkaline rust removers. They require special equipment, and a specific procedure should be followed. Paint removal. Right. Uh, if you're doing penetrant and you need uh, you need them to remove the paint. Uh, most likely, you don't want them to go ahead and start sanding your part, right? Because you may cause, uh, you may close your indications, right? So in that case, you want to either dissolve, uh, dissolve hot tank. You want to use, uh, right, uh, strippers, uh, solvent paint strippers, bond release paint strippers, right, or dissolving hot tank paint stripper. This requires special equipment, and the specification procedures should be followed. Right? Remember that if, because they needed to remove some paint for you to do something. Right? So they, they come to you that you need to do an inspection. The, the, the part it's painted. And they says they need to do a penetrant. Well, in that case, you cannot do a penetrant because the area is painted. Right? And we know that penetrant is only suitable for discontinuities that are, that are open to the surface. Right, so if you have that paint coating on top, well, you're never going to be able to see that crack. So now they, you tell them remove the paint. Now they come and they 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 sand it, and now 
right? But now when they come to you, you have, okay, you have no more paint and you ask the person, how do you remove that paint? And they said, oh, well, we grit blasted or we sand blasted or we sand it, we powered uh, sand blasted. And then you like, well, you automatically know that if, if you were to do the test, I mean, maybe you may not get an indications, but maybe that's because you have smear metal, right? And you're in, right? And you're not going to get it. So in that case, I would have to acid etch it. Uh, so the correct paint removal process would be to strip it. Etching. Acid or alkaline solutions are used to remove smear metal from operations, including the following. Power wire brushing, sandblasting, solutions open, open up grinding burrs and remove smear metals. Etching and neutralization processes use either tanks or immersions or manual equipment. So pre-cleaning processes to be avoided, right? We don't want uh, liquid honing. Uh, right, we don't want blastings, whether it be shot, you know, shot peen or sand blasting or grit blasting, you know, none of this. You don't want to use a lot of pressure. Power brushing, you don't want to do that uh, because they would tend to close the discontinu discontinuities by smearing the metal, right? Peening or cold work in the surface. Drying test objects. Test objects and potential discontinuity should be completely dry of clean air before the application of penetrant. Any remaining clean air may prevent capillary actions to be of the penetrant and to the discontinuities. Right? So if you have clean air in there, then you may be uh, preventing your penetrant to dwell or to go inside your discontinuity. Some procedures require the application of isopropyl alcohol or acetone to promote drying. Drying ovens are sometimes required. Dwell time. Dwell time is the period of time to allow penetrant to enter and fill the discontinuities open to the surface through capillary action. Liquid penetrant is drawn out, drawn out of a discontinuity entrapment to the test object surface during the so-called development time or developer dwell time. Liquid penetrant may spread into the developer coating to form enhanced indications. This is often referred to as the reverse capillary action. Okay. So the application of penetrant. We can apply penetrant pretty much any way you can get it on the surface. You can spray it, you can brush it, you can pour it, or you can actually dip the part in penetrant itself. Test surfaces should remain wetted the entire penetrant dwell time. Ultraviolet radiation sources may assist when, flu when using fluorescent, fluorescent penetrants. So when you use a fluorescent penetrant, right, because the penetrant is yellow-green, you can use your ultraviolet light to make sure that you covered all the pen that, that, that you covered all your part in penetrant. So In, in this example here, right, you can use the ultraviolet light. Well, this is after it's been wiped clean, right? We have some background of penetrant here. You can see it's not fully clean. Right? But you see, if this is the penetrant here. There's little puddles of penetrant, and the cracks are the same color of the penetrant. You can use your ultraviolet light to make sure that every part in this, and that every area in this part um, was applied penetrant to. Okay. Application of color contrast, right? And this would be uh, type 2, being uh, visual or visible penetrant. Application of penetrants also includes the HAS. Technicians should, require, should review procedures to ensure complete coverage of the area of interest. Right? You don't want to miss any areas. Areas that you miss uh, applying penetrant to are going to be areas that you're not going to inspect. Right? Test object held in suspension. 
while, while the required dwell time, right? So they put penetrant, and right now this part it's in its dwell period, its dwell time, right? So the penetrant is actually working into any type of uh, discontinuities or open surface um, cavities that you may have. Fluorescent rinse stations, right, they required about 10 foot candles of ambient light or 100 lux of white light, right? But uh, and less than 200 uh, microwatt centimeter squared of near ultraviolet radiation. And this is for, for fluorescent stations, right? And this is the illumination you want at the rinse station. Right? Why do you want to have uh, ultraviolet light in it? Because you want to make sure that you have, uh, with, I mean, you, you, you know, that you want to make sure that you actually remove the, that you have a good uh, contrast ratio, and that you, that you, that your background is is the adequate, right? Fluorescent evaluation stations should be about a thousand microwatts centimeter squared of near ultraviolet radiation, as measured at the test surface. And the ambient light should not be greater than two foot candles. So in your inspection, in your rent station, they tell you you can have up to 10 foot candles of white light, right? And 100 uh, microwatt centimeter square of ultraviolet light is fine. Why? Because we, we're just concerned. We're just trying to see that we are removing the right amount of penetrant, right? That it's being removed uh, as much as we want. Whereas in, in our inspection area, our evaluation station, right, we want it to be dark. That's why we only have two foot candles. And, but we want to have a lot of ultraviolet light. And I'll show you an example here in a second. Guys, give me just a minute. You okay, Juan? Yeah, Augie. Oh, okay, just making yeah. sure you're okay there. Yeah, no, no, give me, give me just a minute. I'm looking at something here.
Yeah, guys. I'm sorry. I just stop for a second. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, so our, our inspection area, we wanted to be dark, and we wanted to uh, have um, more ultraviolet light. So, something I wanted to show you here is Uh, in, in this area, right, uh, and the, you see maybe this is where we apply the penetrance, right, where we clean it, right, uh, where we apply the, 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 the emulsifiers. Maybe this is my rinse station, right, it's a little darker, right, and then this is probably where we let it dry, and maybe this is my inspection area, that's why you have these drapes, because you want it, it's a fluorescent method, right, type 1. So it's going to be, you need a dark area, right? No more than two foot candles. Again, another penetrant line, right? As you can see, maybe the penetrant starts in here. The line starts here, and it makes its, well, its way back into, all the way into this uh, dark area where it's going to be my inspection area, right? And uh, that's why you have those drapes. Okay, so, and the light, you want it to be 1,000 microwatts centimeters squared at 15 inches. Okay, that's, that's the requirement, at 15 inches, right? So we have, a, we have, a, we put our light, right? And at 15 inches, we put a sensor, right? And it should read a thousand microwatts centimeter square. If we get uh, a lower intensity on this, then that light is not producing the minimum amount of ultraviolet light required for the inspection. Okay, so at 15 inches, visible dye penetrant, right? usually requires a hundred foot candles of white light on the test surface. Why? Right? You don't want it to be dark. Now you want it to be, it's visible, right? It's not fluorescent. Now we're talking about visible dyes, so now you want white light in your inspection area. So now you don't want, as in the other one, that you wanted only two foot candles maximum. Now you want a hundred foot candles, right? Because we're doing the opposite test. This level should be verified against the governing Procedure, standard, or verification, right? So, your procedures will tell you what they what they want, right? And this is usually a light meter, right? And uh, you have the this is a, apparently this is the ultraviolet, right? and and we use it to check the intensity, right? So it'll read here and to this sensor, right? To this here is to where you aim. This has got to be 15 inches from your lamp. Right? So if your lamp is here, then this thing has to be at 15 inches from it. Right? And it's got to read a thousand microwatts centimeters square. Okay. And uh, there you have your little jig or your fixture. And then you put your little sensor there, exactly at 15 inches, and right, there's a typical fixture. Now you also have this other type of light meter for, for white light, right? And uh, it does the same thing, you know. Now with white light, obviously you don't got to put it at 15 inches because you you just want to see what ambient light you got at the inspection area. Okay, so penetrant. Water rinse methods A, B, and D, right? A being water washable, B being uh, lipophilic post emulsifying, and D being hydrophilic post emulsifying.
One. Hello. What, okay. what happened? What happened? No, okay. He just he put this one up, and he was talking about. I, he was talking about the water rinse, and the, and all of a sudden he stopped. Okay. Hey, Augie. Yo. The lady who uh, who hit the uh, the Mega Million. Uh huh. It's not related to you. I don't know. Did you make sure? I don't. I don't. I don't know anything about it. I don't, I don't know anything about it. He said he's be, he's coming back on Friday. Yep. Okay, there he is. The one? Yep. Okay. You guys can see me all right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you guys, I lost you. Uh, let's see. Here, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, so we, we don't want our water to can, be shot. Can, huh? can you go? Can you go back one? I think no. You were back one still. Yeah. This is where you lost us. Right here. Okay. We you want our water to be at at a velocity or at a pressure no more than forty psi. Hello. One. Uh
Yep, there you go. We'll grab an angle. Uh, and hide off. Yeah, no, Heidel, I, Heidel fell off after you did, and he hasn't come back on. You want me to try to give him a call? Uh, yeah, if you want to. Okay. Hey, Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, no, the que sabía que when you went to the bathroom, the the computer dropped over, over there for one, but he's back on now. So, okay. No. No, 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 I'll carry you, I'll carry you, yeah, I'm good, okay. You know, we were talking too before the, you know, before it dropped on him. Yeah. Oh, now his phone's going straight to voicemail. I sent him a he, message. But yeah. Do you know if he was on the phone or was he on his computer? I don't. I think he's on his phone. I don't think he's ever on his computer. Uh, I bet you his phone died. Yeah, because it's going straight to voicemail. Yep. Well, my rank once, and then he went to voicemail. Yeah, his phone died, and he's just going to keep doing it now. Okay. So let me see how many more slides we got before we got to. Oh, my back. <laughs> so how's Lake Charles, man? How's Lake Charles? Oh, man, Lake Charles is treating me good. It's cold. Yeah. It's a nice little town. Not too bad. I heard AAR acquired a, an entity up in, um, was it in Minnesota or some shit like that? Yeah, we got one over there. In Duluth? In Duluth. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we got one over there. We got Oklahoma, Offsprings. Indianapolis, Lake Charles, Duluth, Miami. No shit. Yeah, we got a bunch. Nothing in Columbus, Georgia, right? No, no, no. I don't think so. Or Atlanta? No, I don't think so. I'm surprised they don't do anything in Atlanta, man. As much yeah. aviation. Wow, that's interesting. So what I want to get uh, uh, to, right, is we are on slide 64. Are we not? No. Nope. We are on slide 61. I want to go all over to slide... ...82, and no more than that. Okay. Because then we're going to start talking about indications, and I think that's a good cut-up point for you guys to kind of review this video again today or tomorrow. Okay. And for me to start packing up. Okay. So if you want, let's just continue with the class. I mean, it's probably going to be like 10, 15 more minutes. Got it, Chief. Go yeah. for it. I mean, Hyder can see this. Not so much. Okay, I'm gonna mute then. Okay. Okay. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Augie? Hang on, it's it's still it's still acquiring it. My screen? Yes. Awesome. Good. All right. So we want the water on how we're gonna right. We don't want we want it to be at 45 to 75 degrees uh, to our surface, right? And we wouldn't want it to be too close, near too or too far from our surface, right? And so we want it to be between our our our, our water source, if it's a hose, right, or a bottle, whatever, however you're using. Uh, you want it to be between six to 24 inches from the surface. You want your water temperature to be between 50 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And uh, and the water pressure, right? About 10 to 35 psi is generally used, but should not exceed 40 psi. I think I said 45, right? If I said 45, I'm sorry. It's 40 psi. It should not. Uh, 10, 10 to 35 is, is generally used, but you should not exceed uh, 40 psi. Okay. So that's a typical water rinse, right? Uh, we have this guy, right? He's obviously shooting at an angle, right? You could see that uh, even though it looks like a mist here, it's it, this is a penetrant gun, or at least this gun, it's it, it should give you some uh, coarse droplets. And uh, right, the distance where he's shooting is between those those uh, six and a fourteen, I believe, or six and twenty-four inches. Okay. Solvent removal. So after the required dwell time, this is this is method C, right? For uh, what we do is we wipe the, the instead of washing it washing it up with water, right? As we do with water washable and post emulsifiable. Uh, penetrants when we use uh, emulsifiers to make them more washable, right? Solvent removals, right? Uh, the way they are worked is we wipe the test area with a lint-free absorbent towel that has a color contrast with the penetrant, and then we use a clean section. And, and then what you do is, at each swipe, you kind of, you know, uh, try to use a, a clean section on your on your on your rag. After the removal of the bulk of penetrant, lightly dampen a clean cloth. Do not soak or saturate the cloth with cleaner. Continue to wipe the area until no evidence of penetrant is observed, right? Because you want to have a good background so you can have good contrast. Never apply solvent to the part and then clean it, right? You don't want to saturate or soak your, your rag. You want to moist it, right? You want to dampen it with, uh, with your with your cleaner and then go ahead and, and clean it. Make a final wipe with a clean dry cloth and verify that there is no evidence of penetrant on the cloth. Allow the cleaner to evaporate before the application of the developer. So developers, right? They draw penetrant from the indication. Okay. They expand the width of the indication, right? You have that crack, you have that penetrant. Uh, when you apply a film of developer, this developer is going to suck some of this penetrant. It's going to make a flood, right? And now, instead of your indication being this wide, it's going to be this wide, right? It's going to increase the brightness of the penetrant above the penetrant bulk brightness. All right, it's going to increase film thickness to exceed the eye's thin film thickness threshold to make the, indica the indication detectable. Right? Because it's going to blot it more. It's going to make it come out some more. Right? And then, obviously, we have different types of developers that we already talked about, which is form A, B, C, D, and E. A being dry powder, B, water soluble, right? and this is in tanks. Water soluble when it mixes with uh, water. Then you have water suspendable, which requires a, a, a pump to agitate 
and uh, you know, and keep that developer mixed with the water. Then you have non-aqueous type one, right, for for fluorescent penetrance. Uh, then you have also form D non-aqueous type two, right, for visibles, and these are spray cans, right. And then you have special application developers, which is your form B. Right. So form A. Dry developers are applied to, 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 to dry test of their surfaces by the following methods. So we can apply this dry powder by air suspension, electrostatic spray, spraying, which is you know is common in automated systems, right? We can immerse the part in this powder. The powder is lightly and fluffy. The, pow the powder is lightly and fluffy and clings to the test object surfaces in a fine film. Dry powder is most useful, most useful on rough surfaces and automated processing units uh, using penetrant systems, fluorescent penetrant systems. Then we have water soluble form B, and. Uh, Developers cons uh, consist of a powder dissolved in water and applied by the following means. We can dip it, we can dip the test object in the solution. We can flow the solution over the test object. Right? Uh, so we can, apply, we, can, we can probably apply it with a hose. Uh, we can spray the solution onto the test object, and this type of aqueous developer forms a translucent film. Okay? Water soluble developers can be for fluorescent dyes. Right? And we don't recommend form B for visible dyes. Right? And we don't recommend them with water washable uh, penetrants. Right? Water washable uh, water in the developer may remove the water washable penetrant from the discontinuities. Right? So you have your part, you apply your penetrant, the penetrant that's in your, in your cavity, uh, it's water washable. Well, if you apply this type of penetrant, this type of developer to blot your indication, right, because it has water in it, you may very well be cleaning the penetrant of your indication, right? So it's not recommended when you use water washable penetrants, right? When you use when you use those penetrants that have the emulsifier in them, right? You don't want to use Form B developers. Right, and they can save time during processing since drying it's included in the development well draw time. Okay. Supplied as a dry concentrate that must be mixed and maintained at the proper ratio of developer to the ratio of developer to water. Right? So we gotta we gotta maintain the ratio of the developer. The developer should be checked at regular intervals for penetrant contamination. And water evaporation per approved specifications. Okay. Then we have method C, right, which is water suspendable developers, and they are also supplied as a, as a dry concentrate that must be mixed and maintained at the proper ratio of developer to water. Right. And uh, suspend aqueous developers does not dissolve in water, so it must be thoroughly uh, agitated before the application to suspend. Uh, particles in water, right? They suspend in the water, so we gotta agitate them. It requires the pump. Right? Whereas water soluble dissolves in the in the in the waters, and it doesn't require the pump to be agitated. Uh, water suspendables, right? The development of of indications does not begin until the moisture is completely evaporated from the developer. Okay. And the thickness of the coating and its white color work well with visible dyes. Right? So this one, it actually works well with visible dyes. Test objects should be checked to ensure a, a uniform coating of developer uh, of developer has been applied. Developer should be checked at regular intervals for penetrant contamination and water evaporation per approved specifications with a hydrometer. Right? Removal of dried suspendable developers, and this is the form C, right? Again, water suspendable. Removal of dried suspendable developers may be more difficult because they are not 
soluble, uh, soluble in water. All aqueous developers necessarily contain biocides, erosion inhibitors, and wetting agents. Then you have the non-aqueous, which is the aerosol cans, right? And we have type 1 and type 2. And they are supplied in a ready-to-use condition, right? Uh, frequently used, uh, frequently in aerosol cans. Not aqueous developers is the most sensitive form of developers, right? Because of the solvent action, con because they have a solvent uh, in them, right? They contribute to the absorption and adsorption mechanisms of the developer by entering the discontinuity and dissolving into the liquid penetrant. Right? So, non-aqueous type one and type two are the most sensitive, right? the ones that would make you block the most. Adsorption is the surrounding of the developer particles by adhesion, which coats the surface of the particles. Absorption is the assimilation of penetrant into the bulk of the particles. Prior, prior to, to spraying the developer, the following procedures should be followed. The aerosol cans require agitation before spraying. So you want to agitate your can before you go ahead and start spraying your developer. The test object must be thoroughly clean, uh, dry. Several thin uniform coats are preferred over one heavy coat. Okay, so a very light film will do, will do the job. You don't need to apply it too much. A check, uh, a check spray must be performed before the spray of the test surface to prevent uh, spattering of the developer. So before you spray onto the part, you want to make sure you agitate your can and kind of check spray it a couple times on the air you know, or onto a surface. And once you know that you're getting the right uh, flow, right, and you're not going to get spattering, then you go ahead and you give your part a, lint, a, a thin film of developer. Right? And here you can see your different, right? Here you have your developers. Right? Most likely these are visible, this red, this uh, red developers here. Uh, penetrants, uh, I'm sorry, penetrants here. And you have this two would be your developers, and uh, these developers, right? These are probably non-aqueous. Right? Then you have your solvent removers, right? With your cleaners over here, which will be used to remove that penetrant. Okay. And obviously, uh, if we were to use this kit here, we have a rag, we have cleaner, a developer, and this. This is most likely a method C solvent removal. Right? We apply penetrant, then we spray some cleaner onto our rag to wipe off the surface of our part, and then we'll apply a thin film of developer. And obviously, like I said, this is the visible uh, fluorescent kit. I know that this is not fluorescent, but yeah, it's penetrant. Development dwell time. The development of indication does not begin until the moisture is completely evaporated from the developer. The test object must be monitored very closely during the developer dwell time to properly evaluate the indications as they form. Typically, the developer dwell time is a minimum of 10 minutes. Always reference the specification, right? The point at which the developer dwell time begins depends on the type of developer used. Wet developer's dwell time begins, begins as soon as the developer is dry. Dry and non-aqueous developer begins at, begins at the time of uh, application. Okay? So for wet developers, you've got to wait until it dries out. Right? And this would be water soluble and water suspendable. Right? And for dry and non-aqueous, right, uh, this developers, right, you would have uh, your your dwell time, right, of the developer begins as soon as you spray it. So as soon as you spray it, you start inspecting. And uh, that is as far as I want to go today. Because now we're going to start heading into, into indications.
Okay, so we have covered about 40, almost 43 percent of our of our PowerPoint slides. I think we've done pretty well. Uh, if you can watch this video again, uh, I think uh, I mean I think it, you know the, the the slides do a good job as far as explaining you know, uh, you know going over the uh, explaining the the whole method. And I think the video is going to help out a lot too. So if you can take a look at those, you know, uh, whenever you can. And tomorrow we'll probably try to hit. If we don't finish tomorrow, well, tomorrow I'm traveling. So it'll have to be Saturday. If we don't finish by Saturday, we will get pretty much at least uh, very close to the to the end, if not finish everything. Okay, but at least you have a general idea of how penitent works and uh, different, the different types, methods, sensitivities, okay, developers, and so forth. One, uh, are we uh, are we supposed to be doing quizzes on these chapters or on these lessons? No, no, I'm not going to give you quizzes this time for this. Okay, so I know we didn't do quizzes for the for magnetic for particle either. Right. So no. That's why I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. No. I just that's wondered fine. if I missed something or not. That's why. No, no, no. No, that's fine. No, I'm not going to give you quizzes for this. Uh, uh, we will do. I, I have quizzes that we can do if you want to do some. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if it's possible. You, you know. Yeah. Let, let me get some more to my end. And as mm -hmm. soon as I get there, I'll go ahead and see you some quizzes that we can probably do. Okay? Oh, okay, perfect. Perfect. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, for now, let's just stop here. You know? Okay.